Have you ever been sitting down watching a movie and a loved one, a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend comes in in the middle of the movie, sits down next to you and starts saying, what's happening now? What's going on? Who's that person? Why is this happening? Have you ever had that experience? Many of you are nodding. Some of you may be this person and some of you may be this person. I'm not going to make any judgment about who is who, okay? But we know what that's like. The reason why I mention that is that to understand the scripture today, the gospel today, we need to realize, and this is true every week, when we hear the gospel, we're actually coming into the movie halfway through or even further than halfway through. And so to understand what's happening in today's gospel, it's so important that we understand that the movie's already running and there's been a whole lot of things happening before that. In order to make sense of the movie, in order to understand the story today, we need to know what's gone before. So there's a few things that you really need to know. First of all, what happened previously, but then also a couple of bits that happened right around this time and then at the very end of the Bible, okay? So here are the four things you need to know to understand this very rich passage. And we won't be able to do it justice because there's so much to it, but I'm going to try and give you the guts of it, okay? So the first thing you need to know is that when when we hear a story in the Bible about a person at a well, everybody who knows the Bible, who's come in, not in the middle of the movie, but they know the whole overarching story of the Bible, they think at that moment, oh, a wedding is about to happen. A wedding's about to happen. Did you notice that the well was called Jacob's Well? Well, one of the guys who gets married as a result of a meeting at a well is Jacob. He meets his future wife at a well. The same thing had happened to Isaac, okay, his dad. The same thing will happen to Moses. Either there's a conversation or they actually meet their future bride at a well. So when you hear this story today of the Samaritan woman at a well and Jesus comes up, the people in Jesus' time or the people who were listening to John's gospel originally would have gone, oh, where's the wedding? Who's getting married? That's a pretty important detail, isn't it, to understand what's happening in the story today. The second thing that we need to understand is something about the Samaritans, okay? So you hear from the gospel, you understood that the Samaritans and the Jews don't get on well. The reason for that is because they were actually once upon a time much more closely connected. So when King David unites the 12 tribes of Israel under him as one kingdom, there were 12 tribes and there was 10 northern tribes or there were 10 northern tribes and two southern tribes. Okay? They become one kingdom under King David But around 150 years or so after David, maybe a little bit longer, the Assyrians come. Sorry, before the Assyrians. Around 150 years after David, the kingdom splits into two. And so there's now a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is what we call Judah, and it's where we get the word Jew from, the Jews. Okay, The northern kingdom, which is made up of those what was those ten tribes, they become the northern kingdom, And they are called the Samaritans because the capital of that new northern kingdom was a place called Samaria. Okay? So we now understand something of where the Samaritans come from, right? So that means that they were part of the promises of God to Abraham and to Moses. They were part of the group that were led out of Egypt. In other words, they were worshipping the God of Israel. But then several hundred years later, in in the 8th century BC, 722, the Assyrians invade the northern kingdom. They invade Samaria. What the Assyrians did, it was part of their kind of scorched earth policy, was that they took all of the leaders and influential people and they banished them to other parts of the empire. And then they brought other peoples in from other places to kind of wipe out or eradicate the group that was there. They didn't have to kill them. What they did was they just blurred all the boundaries. There was lots of intermarriage. And we know from the Bible, from the first book of Kings, that when that happened, 
five different people groups were settled in that northern kingdom. Five different groups came from other places and they brought with them their gods. So as far as the people of, of Judah were concerned, the Jewish people were concerned, the Samaritans were kind of like heretics because they worshipped now not the God that they had been called by, the God of Israel, but they worshipped him but with a whole lot of pagan practices or worship of those other gods thrown into the mix, kind of melded together as it were. So the reason why there's this tension is, first of all, actually, as often happens, they're really a feuding family, but secondly, there's been some changes in belief as a result of that process. So why might that be significant? Well, remember, if this is a story about a wedding, part of the conversation about with the, with the woman and Jesus is that it's actually a conversation about husbands too, isn't it? And now, does it sound significant that she had five? If there were five people groups that came in and brought with them their gods, and that that was part of what changed and shifted the Samaritan people's worship, all of a sudden now, we see something happening, not just to this woman, I'm sure that encounter with Jesus and the woman happens, but she's actually going to represent something for the whole of Samaria that in and through Jesus, they're going to be offered the chance to be wedded back to God. Because you see, in the, the third part we need to understand in relation to the Old Testament, in relation to the Scriptures, is that throughout the Scriptures, throughout the Scriptures, when God speaks of his relationship with his people, he often uses the metaphor or the symbolism of a marriage. So there's a covenant between husband and wife that happens in marriage. And God says, look, when you want to understand the kind of relationship that I want with the human race, in and through Israel and out through Israel to the whole of the world, the best way to understand that is to understand that it's like a marriage. And so just in a couple of... And then the final piece that we need to understand is that just a couple of chapters earlier, this is from John 4. In John 2 we have Jesus being described as the bridegroom. Jesus is being described as the bridegroom. In the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, the church will be described as the bride. So all of, this, all of a sudden, this story takes on a whole new resonance and significance. Yes, it's about this encounter with this woman, but it's actually about this whole people group, the Samaritans, coming back to the true worship of God. We don't have time to go into it all now, but you can perhaps see how the conversation about the right kind of worship that people should have, that the woman has with Jesus, has got everything to do with this context, this background that's taking place. The point of the story is that the people of Samaria get to the moment at the end of the gospel where after they've, had that, after they've met Jesus, they say, look, we believe now not because of what you have said to this woman, not because of her testimony back to them, but because they had talked with Jesus and they now realise that he's the saviour of the world. What Jesus is doing, the way he understands his mission, his purpose in coming, is to actually bring about the marriage, if you like, of God and the human family, to re-establish that covenant. Now it's a, a new and unbreakable covenant between God and his people. That's why Jesus comes. Which means that the Bible is a love story. It's about a wedding. And in the most important part to understand about that is that the love story takes us up into it. As I was reflecting upon the scriptures this week, I had Taylor Swift's love story running around in my head, which is one of those earwormy, annoying kind of moments but I, after a while, after I was resisting it for a long time, I found myself saying, that's exactly right. This is a love story. Taylor Swift talks about Romeo and Juliet, but it's a far better love story than that because that ends in tragedy. This story ends with the union of God and his people. It's a love story between God and us. That God loves you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to unite himself to you that you might discover 
not just in a theoretical way, not just in an impersonal way, but in the very depths of your heart, the depths of your being, that you're loved by God. If that's what's going on in the story, what's the whole deal with the water bit? It starts off as a little bit of playful repartee, doesn't it, between Jesus and the woman. Would you like a real drink? No, look, I always come here to get a drink. Would you like living water? Yeah, that sounds great. And all of a sudden, Jesus takes it to a whole other level when he says, the water that I'll give you is living water that'll be like a fountain, like a spring gushing up inside of you to eternal life. A little bit later in John's Gospel, Jesus will say, the water that I shall give is the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is love. The water that Jesus promises has everything to do with the love story. That is the Bible. Everything to do with it. Because the water that he's promising, the living water that gushes up like a fountain is actually God himself, the Holy Spirit, the very love of God poured out and given to us. Given to us. How do you know that you're loved by God? Well, there's a water, there's something like water gushing up inside of you that says, I know that I have been loved so much, so beautifully. It's the Holy Spirit that shows us the love that Jesus has for us. And that's why the most important symbol of baptism is water. Because it's not just water that washes away our sins, it is that but it's also the water that is the Holy Spirit, the very love of God poured into our hearts. We have amongst us uh, today a number of people who are preparing for baptism. They have been called catechumens and they've been on the catechumenal journey for some time. That means that they've been receiving instruction, they've been learning what it means to believe in Jesus and to be a follower of him. Since the beginning of Lent, they've had a new name. They're now called the elect, the elect. And that means that they've been called, that they've been chosen by God. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to pray for them in a very special way because the time of their baptism is drawing very close. Their baptism's coming up at the Easter vigil in just a few weeks' time. And so we pray a special set of prayers today that we call the scrutiny. You know what what a scrutiny is, right? If you scrutinize something, you study something really closely, right? You scrutinize a text or some particular thing. Well, in this scrutiny, God is is scrutinizing their hearts. He's preparing them for the almighty gift that is baptism, where they receive the living water that is the Holy Spirit in a whole new way. So I'd, I'd like to invite our elect and their sponsors and godparents, if they're here, to come up to the front now, please. So if the elect could come and stand just at the very front step and the sponsors and godparents could stand behind them, that would be fantastic. Great. Perry, come on down the front here, mate. Can't, don't be bashful, not at the back. All right, terrific. So, elect of God, I'm going to invite you now to bow your heads and to pray. Let's pray now for these elect whom the church has confidently chosen. May they successfully complete their long preparation and at the Paschal Feast find Christ in his sacraments that they may ponder the word of God in their hearts and savour its meaning more fully, day by day. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may learn to know Christ, who came to save what was lost. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may humbly confess themselves to be sinners. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may sincerely reject everything in their lives that is displeasing and contrary to Christ. 
Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Holy Spirit, who searches every heart, may help them to overcome their weakness through his power. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That the same Holy Spirit may teach them to know the things of God and how to please him. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That their families also may put their hope in Christ and find peace and holiness in him. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That we ourselves, in preparation for the Easter feast, may seek a change of heart, give ourselves to prayer, and persevere in our good works. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That throughout the whole world, whatever is weak may be strengthened, whatever is broken restored, whatever is lost found, and what is found redeemed. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, including Michaela Lovett, Olivia Talanga, Carlo Olivia, Pamela Pierce, and Ludovic Tavalovic, may their self sacrifice in life lead them now to be raised to eternal life in Christ. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. God of power, you sent your Son to be our Saviour. Grant that these catechumens who, like the woman of Samaria, thirst for living water, may turn to the Lord as they hear his word and acknowledge the sins and weaknesses that weigh them down. Protect them from vain reliance on self and defend them from the power of Satan. Free them from the spirit of deceit so that, admitting the wrong they have done, they may attain purity of heart and advance on the way to salvation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 